Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. And with these interviews, I try to bring you behind the scenes so you can hear the space and astronomy research, the ideas that are coming directly from the scientists themselves. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Slava Turishev. Dr. Turishev, uh, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Fraser, very nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me for the conversation here. What I'm do what am I doing? I am an astrophysicist at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'm interested in studying wherever gravity is playing a significant role. Any phenomena where gravitation, relativistic gravitation, is uh, is a part of life. This is what I'm interested in: gravitational waves, studying uh, general relativity in the in the solar system. Uh, looking at anything which is anomalous in the motion of the spacecraft and the solar system, looking for anything that would resemble the next, uh, the next theory of gravity, because we understand that general relativity may not be the final uh, theory of gravity. So anything that relates to that is uh, e excited me. And so there are other things I'm, I'm doing, uh, looking for asteroids that are probably you know, uh, the, uh, the Earth crossing orbit, so there may be some, in, it's at some point, some of them will come close to our planet. But that's something is uh, not that, that we will be talking today about. My main interest these days is solar gravitational lensing. Why? Because uh, we are going through a very significant period in the history of astronomy. Because for the last uh, 20 years, we witnessed a significant a number of exoplanets discovered by modern techniques. And so we use telescopes on the ground, we use telescopes in space, we use, uh, we build more telescopes and we will be looking for more exoplanets uh, orbiting nearby stars. So, but the challenge here is that we will never be able to see them, those uh, planets directly, because uh, our classical telescopes are not, uh, uh, Allow, do, do not, will, will not allow us to do that because their magnifying power is very limited, their resolution is very limited. So even the nearby planet uh, like Proxima b, we will not be able to see the surfaces of that of that, that object. And with the solar gravitational lens, we at least have a good promise that at some point humanity will be able to see surfaces of exoplanets all the way to 100 light years away. So, so, so let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about this idea of just like a gravitational lens first. What is it? When light travels uh, in the vicinity of massive body, the light uh, trajectory is al altered. It's not uh, moving in the straight line anymore. The trajectory is bent towards the body. And essentially, if we take two rays that, that are going on opposite sides of that a massive body, at some point, the, uh, both rays will be bent, will be bent towards the body, and then at some point they will intersect. And so they will come into focus. And so, but now imagine that the body is spherical, so you have many, many more rays going in, around the circumference of that spherical body. And essentially when the rays uh, intersect, they will, uh, the gravity, uh, sort of the, the gravity, the massive body acts as a lens. And so it's similarly to optical uh, lens, lenses that we have, gravity acts as a lens, it focuses light. It has a very interesting aberrations, like spherical aberration, but with the solar gravity uh, that we have in, in the solar system, uh, the most massive body is of course our, is the sun. So Earth, the Earth, Earth or Jupiter may also be acting as a lens, but the, this lens is extremely weak. Uh, sun is the most massive body in the solar system. So, but when we use the sun as the lens, we suddenly uh, have a gift from nature. Mm -hmm. Why? Because in the focal area of the solar gravitational lens, the light is uh, amplified by a factor of 10 to the 11th. It's 100 wow. million times. And now we're talking about not only significant light amplification, but also angular resolution. Because we know that from classical diffraction theory, we know that uh, lambda over d, well, wavelength and the diameter of your telescope gives you a resolution of your optical system. In the case of the sun, the d is the diameter of the sun. So we're talking about nano, 0.1 nano arc seconds, which is not available by any other techniques. So we just don't have technologies to do that. So can you give us some perspective? Like if we were some super advanced civilization, we were able to build just a really big telescope, but 
Hubble style or James Webb style, how big of a telescope would we need to build to match the magnification potential of the sun as a gravitational lens? I will answer this in a different way. Um, let's take our own planet Earth. The diameter of that planet is about 13,000 uh, uh, kilometers. We move that planet uh, at 100 light years away from us. 100 light years, it's a reasonable distance. So to image that object with just one pixel using diffraction limited uh, telescope, you need to have a telescopic aperture of 90 kilometers. <laughs> it's nine zero kilometers, right. right? It's just one pixel, one pixel. But we all, with our cell phones, with our pr proliferation of imaging technologies, we used to have megapixel images, just give me a megapixel image of our planet. That's, if you have like blue, about a pale blue dot that Carl Sagan uh, named the picture that, uh, uh, that taken of our planet, it's not enough. We don't, we are not happy with just one pixel of our pale blue dot. We wanna have multi-pixel resolution of those objects. And so, that if you want to have 100 pixels by 100 pixels across, you need to multiply that 90 kilometer aperture by that number. If you want to have megapixel images, you need to multiply that 90 kilometer aperture by 1,000 times. So that's not possible. To a 90,000 kilometer telescope, single lens telescope to give you both the angular resolution and the increase in, in brightness absolutely. absolutely that's that's a very big telescope it's something that we call tyranny of diffraction limit because uh, to be able to restart resolving objects and meaning you can separate details on the surface of uh, of the distant objects you need to have larger aperture this is why astronomers always wanted to have a larger aperture and so but in the case of distant exoplanets they're too distant and they're too faint so when you image exoplanets, we are dealing with two problems. First problem is that they are faint. They are not self-luminous. So you, they only reflect light and they emit in the infrared. So they reflect light and optical from their host star and then uh, they emit their own light uh, in infrared. So this is the typical spectra that we have to observe and they are extremely faint. So the typical objects are that we will be looking at, they are in magnitudes maybe uh, 37th, 39th magnitude. We never observed anything like that. Right. Never. Like, so like we, we hit like what into the high teens, like the, the exactly the, the, the 19, the 20th 20th magnitude. Yeah. yeah 20th magnitude is pretty much a limit of for many, for, for many instruments, for many wishes, but we're talking about 37th magnitude. It's not possible with the, with techniques that we have. So it's, a, they're faint, but also they're extremely distant. Right. And so, uh, to deal with the, with that, we need to have large amplification factor to uh, that the uh, amplification comes usually with the larger collecting aperture. So the larger aperture you have, the more amplification you get. Right. And so if we use, say, interferometry, we could build, say, put two Hubble Space Telescopes, separate them by 90,000 kilometers. We could get the resolution, but we wouldn't get the amplification that would be that we would need to be able to see the so if we had two quasars really close together they're both very bright and we could see them but but we wouldn't be able to see faint objects like another planet earth purely through with, say interferometry with interferometers it's another interesting story because of what we will what we would get with interferometers is of course is of course resolution the larger the baseline the better the higher is the resolution of uh, of interferometer but if you, but if you want to use interferometer for imaging so then we need to have variable baselines and those baselines would have to rotate and uh, to cover something called UV plane. We need to have a, a separate, pretty much there is a field aperture. Uh, so we need to fill that aperture with different baselines, meaning that that interferometer need to change uh, baselines, let's say from one meter to 90,000 kilometers, and then it needs to uh, change uh, orientation. So it's not only in one linear configuration, it has right. to rotate in a sense. And so this way you can think about trying to re re reconstruct a field aperture instrument, but you need to do this fast because planet rotates, everything moves. So with interferometer, you get resolution only in one dimension. 
but it's not it's not the whole picture with interferometers. Usually you expect that interferometer, let's say you have 10 meter telescope, two, two 10 meter telescopes separated by 90 kilometers. So 10 meter telescope is a big enough, but you need to be able to block out the light from the host star because it the field of view of the telescope is large. So it, it will pick up a light from the host star. So you need to block that light from the host star. You need to have an, a coronagraph. And usually internal coronagraph will not work. You need to have star shade. Right. So imagine now interferometer, you have two star shades that are moving in unison with these two telescopes, right? Right. It, but it's not, it's not all because... Um, when we look at those objects, they usually move in the inner part of their host star system, meaning there will be a lot of zodiacal light. So exozody. To deal with exozody, to be able to build a signal-to-noise ratio of seven, you need to integrate at least for thousand years to get SNR seven, maybe for a million years for some systems. So interferometer will give you some sort of hope for resolution, but it's completely impractical because ultimately. Um, you will not be able to see terrestrial planets. Maybe seeing directly, uh, you know, like Jupiter, super Jupiters, uh, their presence uh, in, in, in orbiting the host star. Right. But to be able to resolve even the Earth orbiting around the sun from the distance of, let's say, 10 per sec or maybe 30 per sec, it's not possible within the realistic mission lifetime. We're talking about thousands of thousands of years. To All right. That. All right. So you have, you have dashed our hopes for how powerful orbital telescopes are going to get in the reasonable future. So then let's talk about the power of the gravitational lens using the sun as the gravitational lens. How does that compare to that 90,000 kilometer telescope that we talked about earlier? If I take a one meter telescope and I move it to the focal region of the solar gravitational lens, I can use that one meter telescope and build an image of uh, Proxima B within probably um, three months. So meaning that uh, the Proxima B, if I, if, if I take our own Earth and the Proxima B will be, let's say, uh, the Earth will be uh, orbiting uh, the, uh, the, the Proxima Centauri system. Mm -hmm. And so I can make that image with megapixel resolution within a month. Megapixel. 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 So that would be a, a, a million, a million pixels to so a thousand on a side. You would have a, like that's as good as a old digital camera picture. Absolutely, and that's where the strength of the SGL comes. Uh, the promise of SGL is that we can have megapixel images of, uh, especially nearby planets. Let's say up to ten to fifteen per sec. So we should be able to get. Uh, maybe not megapixel, but maybe you know kilopixel images. Let's say. Uh, maybe 400 by 400, maybe 600 by 600 pixels. And so with this, we can we are talking about resolution on the surface of roughly maybe 25 kilometers on the surface of those objects. <laughs> and so now we're talking about continental lines, weather patterns, topography, yeah. uh, you know, ice caps, the structures. Yeah. But not only that, with SGL, we're talking about spectroscopy as well. So with spectroscopy, you can actually, in the visible, there are some... Um, some weak lines of water, methane, oxygen. But then if you go to infrared, infrared is amazing because with infrared, you can mid infrared, you can actually detect a lot of interesting lines with the SGL. And so now we're talking about looking at the surface spectroscopy. It's not atmospheric spectroscopy, it's surface spectroscopy. So because we will be able to uh, compensate for diurnal rotation, and so remove the cloud cover and actually peek under the under the clouds and start looking at the topography of that uh, of that object. And so that's what SGL gives you. We we are not even, I mean, uh, most of the exoplanetary community are focusing on the efforts of addressing uh, what science can be derived from unresolved imaging of a single uh, target. So we are not we are not resolving that object. We just sort of broadband spectroscopy and uh, imaging of that sort of diffraction limited uh, uh, pixel. And so realistically, um, no imaging science actually is discussed within uh, exoplanetary community. Spectroscopy, broadband spectroscopy of uh, global, uh, global uh, sort of spectroscopy of uh, planetary scale. Now with SGL, you can actually do 
a surface correlated spectroscopy. That means if there is a swamp on that planet, we know whether there is a swamp because methane is being emitted from that part. Hmm. If, if there is some uh, you know, transition from ocean to continent, we know where this transition is happening because we will be able to detect water, detect it in, in, and detect other elements from, uh, from the continents. So that type of science resolved uh, spectroscopy um, and uh, sort of uh, surface spectroscopy. That's something that's not really being addressed by any other missions. With, with, the, with the SGL, we can do that. Now, what is the region? Now, you talked about the focus region from the sun as a gravitational lens. How far away is it from the sun? Absolutely. This is um, uh, because the gravity is extremely weak. And so the focusing uh, of, the, of light uh, uh, by solar gravitational lens is uh, uh, the, the, the focal region begins at 548 astronomical units away from the sun, opposite from the, from the target. We need to move in opposite direction from the target, um, um, basically opposite from the, uh, on, on, on opposite direction from the sun. And so the distance is 548 astronomical units away. Right. So that's the challenge. Our challenge yes. is the distance. So our, there is a great promise, but the challenge is the distance to get there in a reasonable time frame, 25 years, because uh, that's what we want. Light sail, um, uh, um, Icarus, uh, uh, light sail is a planetary society mission that is now orbiting Earth. Icarus is Japanese, the JAXA mm -hmm. flow on that mission, going all the way to Venus, essentially using solar, uh, solar momentum. And uh, the... So soon with the launch of SLS, we will fly another mission built by NASA and the Marshall Space Flight Center. So solar sailing is now getting into into very interesting part of development because two technologies are coming together. First of all, uh, a small uh, spacecraft, uh, so small sats similar to those that were flown on inside lander on Mars, two Marcos, uh, two, two Marcos, uh, cube sats. So those spacecraft are now very capable. Uh, they can uh, benefit from ongoing revolution into electronic world. So all the technologies, all the instruments are now miniaturized. Putting this together with the solar sails, now you have a viable mission. And so a viable mission, uh, you need to do what? You need to unfold your sail. And so then you are using the sail as, like, as a sailboat, essentially. Um, on <laughs> any sailboat has what? Has sail and has rudder. And you have uh, you have solar wind. Essentially, you can go against the wind pretty much using using the uh, using the wind on the sailboat. With the solar sails, what you have you have sail, you have solar radiation pressure, and you have uh, reaction wheels on board. Reaction wheels allow you to actually choose a course such that you will be dumping your kinetic energy and falling onto the sun. Uh, with uh, pretty much uh, four months after launch, with the C three zero, you actually from Earth high Earth orbit. We are flying by solar perihelion. We open the sail, and we're now picking up a lot of uh, solar radiation pressure. The closer we come to the sun, the more uh, the, the higher the solar radiation pressure will become. Uh, with the technologies that we have today, we're using uh, sails that are available in the, in the laboratory today. We can fly as, as close as maybe 0.2 astronomical units from the sun. Hmm. So, and that allows us to pick up velocities of uh, roughly three times the Voyager velocity. Voyager is going with about three astronomical units per year. That's the velocity of Voyager in New Horizons. With the current uh, currently available technology for solar sailing, we can go seven to nine AU per year. And so seven to nine AU per year, imagine with the technology we have today, we can uh, travel, traverse the solar system much faster. So, but then, a sail, te a sail technologies that we develop in, for example, a group uh, uh, led by Professor Arthur Davoyan in UCLA builds new sail materials that will allow us to get to almost uh, uh, 15 solar radii and not being burned by the solar uh, heat. Essentially, it's very reflective material, very lightweight. So coming that close, you can think about uh, reaching the velocities of all the way to uh, pretty much 30 astronomical units per year. So to get to solar gravitational lens, we need to have about 25 AU per year. Mm -hmm. With this velocity, we will go, we will uh, fly uh, by the sun, we'll pick that velocity and reach the solar gravitational lens focal region in about 25 years. Long time, uh, long, uh, long wait, but it definitely worth it. Yeah. So this is our main challenge. People usually say, Slava, you need to move faster or live longer 
to reach the solar gravitational uh, focal region. I said, uh, usually I say I prefer to do both. I want to move fast and live longer. So in, the, in this case, by the time when I'm 100 years old, I want to see that uh, surface of exoplanet that will be imaged by a mission that we will launch in 2032. Well, hopefully you'll be able to get a, a spacecraft named after you like Parker. Uh, in, 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 and be alive to, to see it to see it launch. Now, I mean, there are technologies that could take you faster. I mean, I, so I see you're sort of doing an Oberth maneuver past the sun, getting as much photons as you can. But but if there was more space infrastructure, perhaps you could match this with with laser sails at the same time, and maybe you could accelerate. But but I can imagine the goal is to get out to this this focus range but then be able to loiter there. And so if you're going too fast, then you can't, you can't arrive at the destination and stay there. You're going to be going, you know, say you're going 10% the speed of light, then you're going to zip right through that region. And then you're off into interstellar space. So the key is to find that something that will let you get out there, but then also that be your final orbit as opposed to being off to another star. We do not need to stop. <laughs> to just keep going, observe exactly. as long as you can, right? Exactly, because this, uh, the the properties of the slow gravitational lens, it doesn't have a focal point. It has a semi-infinite focal line. Hmm. It's a spherical aberration, essentially. If you, if you take a spherical lens, you have a spherical aberration. Essentially, that object will have a, a, a semi-infinite focal line. So you don't have to stop. You just continue along that line, and you can image the same planet with even better resolution. Why? And with, with actually better sensitivity. Why? Because solar radiation, I mean, the solar plasma, the, the solar corona is a significant noise factor. The further you are from the sun, the less solar corona will, it will influence the data measurements. So essentially, the further you are, you will be sampling the solar corona uh, because the signal comes on top of solar corona. It's a major noise factor. And so this is why you need to integrate Per pixel integration time is roughly anywhere between uh, 30 seconds, if you're talking about nearby planets, to probably about uh, three minutes, five minutes. So for the furthest planet, it's a per pixel. But now, now you, you 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 need to multiply by number of pixels you want to you want to image the planet with, and you need to move from pixel to pixel because that uh, planet that we discussed, our Earth, which is let's say situated at 100 light years away, the image of that planet will be uh, projected into a cylinder with a diameter of 1.3 kilometers. Now you need to position your spacecraft within that cylinder and move along the uh, sort of axis of that cylinder. And so within 1.3 kilometers uh, distance. And so that's going from pixel to pixel, you image that, uh, you image that object and then you take the, the uh, time series and uh, you process it and recover images. We have shown how it can be done. So it just gets better and better over time. So it, you, you get those first images that say 500 AU. And then as long as you stay in that cylinder targeting whatever planet you're looking at, is there some point where it does fall off thousands of, of AUs, 10,000 AUs? Or, or is it as long as you stay in that cylinder, which I guess is, or, or is it a cone that is narrowing as you get farther and farther away from the sun that you need to remain in that <clears throat> In that it's zone. actually opening. It's not narrowing. It's opening. So the diameter of that planet will be uh, 1.3 kilometers at the distance of 650 AU, but it will be now 2.6 kilometers at 12, 1200 AU. It's opening up, and so essentially, um, but that actually helps you to remove stellar uh, the, the spherical aberration. Right. The further you are, you not not only you sampling less of the solar corona in your data, but also your image is now ex expanded. And so you can actually have a, a better quality uh, uh, imaging. The, the challenge there, of course, will be resource dependent because uh, we will rely on the electric propulsion. We have a small spacecraft with a one meter telescope that will be moving in the image plane. Image plane at any given distance, heliocentric distance will be different image plane. So, but we, we can actually process it. But the point is we need to have uh, as we move with the high, as we continue to move with a very large heliocentric velocity, sort of remove, receding from the solar system, we need to move in the perpendicular direction. And so that motion in the perpendicular direction will be enabled by electric propulsion on board. And so those systems that are, that, that are needed for that motion are already available. So the industry already offers this type of um, mm -hmm. um, 
thrusters. So no new technologies are needed for that for that development. So uh, realistically, electric electric propulsion will be used twice. You mentioned you you mentioned Oberth maneuver. We actually in the initial analysis we didn't use Oberth maneuver flying by the sun. We basically just open up sails when we, when we need to re reorient sails and when we come close, the gust of solar radiation pressure will move us. But uh, we can actually implement Oberth maneuver. We can use uh, let's say maybe um, electro propulsion uh, block uh, during the solar flyby that will accelerate, will, will give us maybe two or three or five AU per year velocity, a little bit more. So we can, we, can, we can do that. But then once we are out there at the focal region, we essentially uh, will be using electric propulsion to move from pixel to pixel in the image plane. And um, I guess your viewers probably uh, will recognize another, another challenge is navigation because at that point, remember, it's a 650 AU pretty much. It's far away, but we need to move within the cylinder of the diameter of 1.3 kilometers. Can that be done? And people will say, no, it's difficult. Pulsar, you the... could do it. No, it's, it's even better. Solar gravitational lens gives us a very good uh, guidance signal because the... Oh, I see. Be because the uh, amplified light from the host star will be out there. And so we can use, and we don't need to deal with solar corona. We don't need to deal with anything. Amplified light is there. And so by the study and the evolution of the Einstein ring uh, formed by the amplified light of the host star, we know exactly how far away we are from the host star optical axis. And we know, at, uh, at knowing the orbital elements of the exoplanet, we know exactly where we will uh, need to be uh, at what, what place and how long do we need to integrate. So there is a guidance signal that uh, SGL gives us. We use the amplified light from the host star to form a local reference frame. So you're looking at the shape of the Einstein ring, and as it starts to get a little out of whack, you know to change your your position slightly to get it back into focus. It's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like focusing a telescope, but in this case, you're moving your spacecraft to get back in focus. It's it's uh, it's something like this. When you are exactly so, the the image of the exo uh, of the host star. The host star will be will be a very bright image, also a big cylinder. So when you're in the middle of that a cylinder, you will have a fully formed Einstein ring. But if you start moving away from that cylinder, if you're away from that cylinder, your Einstein ring initially breaks into arclets, smaller arclets, and then there will be two bright spots. And we know exactly how to calibrate the brightness of the spots depending on the on the spacecraft distance from the optical axis. So you know that the shape, the morphology of, the, of those arclets and the brightness of those arclets will tell you exactly how many does, uh, how, how many uh, tens of meters you are away from the center of that optical axis of the host star. Now, knowing the orbital elements of exoplanet, you can pre-compute where, where this exoplanet will appear because ultimately we need to be there where the exoplanet is and track, track its motion. So essentially, by tracking the motion of the host star with the, another small spacecraft, we can actually form that local reference frame and uh, know exactly where the host star, where the exoplanet will be, and will start moving within the image formed by that exoplanet. The limitation, obviously, is that you get one target, that you one one telescope per target, but if it's just a meter telescope with a solar sail like it sounds like a relatively inexpensive mission. Would you foresee sending many of these out there? Uh, Fraser, three points I want to raise before answering your question. Uh, I think in exoplanetary community, we recognize that uh, the era of uh, surveying missions probably will be over soon because you need to increase your you know, um, you, uh, there will be a, a, a targeted mission, uh, missions coming in. Because uh, to observe every star in the sky, you can't, because there is no enough mission time. So essentially, you need to have targeted uh, uh, observations, because, because you need to observe one target, another target. And so the handful of targets you have to identify before you start observing, b b before you launch. So initially, now with missions that you have, we are discovering planets uh, by observing a particular star multiple times. And so, but we cannot observe infinite number of those stars, right? So there may be, let's say maybe um, 
150 of those targets, maybe uh, maybe thousands of those targets we observe, and then basically we reabsorb re them all the time. The more data we gain, the uh, so uh, for for example, for uh, using astrometric methods of the, uh, using astrometry to detect exoplanets, you have to identify maybe 20 planets, at the 20 stars only. So it's not a surveying mission. Essentially, if you want to do astrometric detection of exoplanets, we are talking about very small, small number of targets. Mm -hmm. So we cannot observe anywhere. Uh, we, we cannot observe every star on the sky. So Gaia was the mission that the European Space Agency launched to do astrometry, uh, global astrometric um, uh, reference frames. And so essentially, Gaia observed billions, billions of stars, billion stars. But uh, for uh, searching for exoplanets, we are not going to be observing that number of uh, stars. So, but those objects are not, it's only indirect confirmation that exoplanets exist around that star. Once you will start uh, uh, putting your resources into observing a particular set of targets, you're immediately talking about fewer and fewer uh, uh, targets in your mission. So we're talking about maybe, maybe 20, maybe 25 targets, because now you identify a particular target of interest. And you want to spend more time with the target studying spectra, studying composition of uh, sort of orbital elements of the target. So it's not a it's not a four pi radiant surveying mission anymore. Right. So with the solar gravitational lens, we will not fly this mission to detect exoplanets because we need to have a good target to start with. Because our field of view is extremely narrow. We're talking about three point five arc seconds. So it's a very narrow field of view. We cannot. Changing that field of view on a different uh, on a different target, you need to move laterally quite significant amount of you know uh, quite a lot. So we are not planning on moving laterally. We basically need to have a very well determined target. But then, as we as we see over and over with planetary missions in the solar system, when we fly to Jupiter, we observe not only one uh, satellite of Jupiter. We observe the whole you know, family of satellites around Jupiter. Same with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Saturn, so Galileo and Cassini spacecraft observed and uh, and detected uh, multiple new satellites. In the case of solar gravitational lens, it's a single system uh, mission where there will be several uh, planets orbiting that particular uh, host star, and we'll be observing all of them, and maybe even the, uh, their moons, their, their satellites. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's that's sometimes something unique. And if you have identify a high value target for us. That I think is the best way to deposit resources. And um, if the mission is affordable, yes, we can contemplate sending several of those missions to, um, to observe images of um, uh, very interesting targets. And soon I believe with James Webb picking up uh, the, uh, the intensity of operations, with James Webb, we probably will see more targets uh, uh, detected. With the tests and operations and more missions coming from European Space Agency, within the next five, maybe to 10 years, well, uh, the zoo of exoplanets will increase from what uh, now about 9,000 planets will have probably up to 40,000 planets. And some of the targets will be extremely interesting because we will be able to observe their spectra and there will, will be some interesting, interesting spectral lines. But remember, those will be indirect detections for the ter terrestrial planets. We will, we will not be able to see them. And so at some point we'll have to decide are we going to be building larger and larger telescopes, going to 16 meters, 24 meters, 30 meters, still observing that blob of, uh, you know, uh, 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 part of the uh, space where this exoplanet is orbiting without seeing it directly? Or maybe it's time to really contemplate sending solar gravitational lens mission to start observing that target directly. And so it's a... It's a single system mission, but that will uh, that will allow us to study the planetary evolution within that particular system. We'll be we will be able to detect uh, signs of um, you know uh, the biosignatures on uh, on on the surfaces of those of of of, 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 of those uh, planets. And that, I think this is the way to think about this because ultimately. Uh, the most interesting targets, we will have to dedicate telescopes to observe those most interesting targets anyway. And so solar gravitational lens will come when we have a very good uh, signal saying that this is Earth, that this may be the Earth 2.0. And then we need to look at this target uh, very specifically. So James Webb will be the finder scope for the solar gravitational 
lens. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. And, and we, we usually, we, we appreciate the significant community efforts because the more targets we discover, the more pressure will be on the community to make the decision what to do next. And realistically, the de, sort of diffraction limit, or the, the tyranny of diffraction limit will, it's already hitting hard because we're building ever larger telescopes. The largest telescope in our built 39 meters in Chile, right? So the extremely uh, European, extremely large telescope. And so there will be 30 meter telescope. Potentially within this century, we can expect seeing 50 meter telescopes on the ground. But in space, probably 6.5 meters that is uh, Astro 2020 recommended will be flown in the next maybe 10 years. But then uh, the next will be maybe 12 meter telescope. That's all, right? Yeah, but still, still on the 90,000 we talked about absolutely. earlier. When yeah. you try to match those numbers, the numbers are unmatchable. And the uh, realization, interferometers, people ask me, okay, we can do interferometers, maybe two EU interferometers. We have uh, two telescopes orbiting the sun uh, separated by two astronomical units. Wonderful. We'll get probably resolution, but we'll never be able to have imaging capability of uh, the field aperture telescope with a large diameter. So when we think about us surrounded by all of the stars in the Milky Way, and as you said, these this cylinder of of magnification is sort of extending out from every star in all directions out to infinity. And I know we do gravitational microlensing all the time to discover planets in the first place. But is there a way to use this technique that you're talking about to try to catch some of these natural lenses forming just by by stars happening to line up perfectly in ways that we could find useful? Uh, the key is uh, dynamics, because if everything is uh, uh, static, if all the targets are nailed to the sky and so then they don't move, then optical axis of those uh, lenses will be fixed. In reality, nothing is static in the universe. Everything moves. Their proper motion, their orbital motion. There is a, a lot of interest and dynamics involved. So those micro lensing events, they do happen. Usually, they're not very predictable. And so when they do happen, they last for about a month. When the brightness of a particular star get uh, brighter and brighter for two, two weeks, and then it starts diminishing and never repeats. So in, in this sense, what we do with solar gravitational lens, we engineer that alignment and we stay on that alignment all the time. And so that's the, ch the, 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 that's the difference because to do the imaging of any object, you need to be aligned uh, to very high precision with that object to be able to still be in within the focal region of the SGL. Sure, but I wonder if, if there's a way to take advantage of gravitational microlensing events better because right now it, it, it's kind of astonishing like even amateur astronomers can use their backyard telescopes to observe the brightness of a star and, and pr contribute their measurements and confirm the existence of of planets it's you can see the power the raw power of these gravitational lenses as they happen but as you say they happen very shortly you get a month and then the planet this 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 one time alignment is over and maybe you've detected a planet but is there a way we can take advantage of gravitational microlensing through science through observatories through techniques to learn more as the lensing event is happening. Obviously, you won't be able to stay in line and observe this, this planet forever. But is there something that we can do to take better advantage of the gravitational microlensing that's happening all around us all the time? See, my take on that is uh, there will be limited advantages to do that, the limited advances, actually. Um, the reason is that with the sun, compared to the sun, we know the optical properties of the sun, solar gravitational lens very well. We can remove the properties of the lens from the data and uh, dealing with true uh, image. With, in the case of microlensing, we don't really know the lens property. We know that the event is happening, but what is actually the lensing body or lensing galaxy, how that mass distributed within that lensing galaxy, it's model dependent. It's not really well understood. We can confirm that there's some morphology in the image, but to, to attribute that morphology of that image that we temporarily have possession for, 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 for four weeks only, we don't really 
we, we cannot um, uh, deduce a very high uh, you know resolution uh, information about the about the source about the object so this is where the challenge is because we're dealing with two unknowns that are just aligned by gravity the first unknown is the is this object the second unknown is the lens itself because lens may have be um, maybe usually lenses astrophysical lenses are not spherical they may be galaxies they're elliptical galaxies and so when we deal with, with elliptical galaxies, the um, point spread function of those objects is very complicated. And really trying to remove that uh, point spread function from the data, trying to deconvolve, it's not that simple. So and even the, if we had, I mean, obviously it's not that simple, but even if we had like, I don't know, like a Vera Rubin telescope that was scanning the entire sky, both searching for gravitational lensing events and characterizing the lenses and the objects better and better and better. It, it doesn't feel like it's a, a useful path to take. No, because uh, uh, the lens itself, uh, properties of uh, gravitational lens is typically not very well known. And uh, to remove the artifacts, l l lenses artifacts from the data, is uh, it's uh, challenging, challenging at least, if not impossible, and yeah. to realistically to assign the, uh, the the high confidence in the data uh, on the image in a particular object without n knowing the optical properties of the lens, it's a little bit will be exaggeration. Right, right. Well, I was hoping the universe had done our engineering for us, but clearly we can't uh, we can't get all the advantages from them. Now. Well, but then Go ahead. Uh, but, so sorry, but then maybe we need to think about not a Dyson sphere, but something like you know Einstein sphere. Well, we have a, a sphere of uh, spacecraft orbiting uh, their sun at five hundred fifty, maybe six hundred fifty AU on a sphere, yeah. and then we observe every object in uh, in the galaxy by using the sun as a lens. So that's our global observatory. Of course, it's not for now, but with the technologies that may that are being developed maybe at some point nuclear fusion a uh, nuclear nuclear uh, propulsion and the will, will come online at some point in the future maybe that will allow us to to do that for now we are limited with propulsion right. heavily limited. yes yeah now now this is more than just an idea you are one of the phase two recipients you're at phase two right for phase the three. for nasa's phase NIAC three. grant phase three Phase three. Phase three. Okay, great. So that's you've gone through three iterations now of developing proposals, working on ideas, getting feedback from NASA. Um, where does the project stand today? Um, thank you for asking this question. Uh, this is our uh, final year of phase three project. Will be done by the end of September this year, twenty twenty two, and. Uh, at the end of, the, uh, of this project, uh, we are aiming at transitioning from um, the uh, NIAC paradigm, uh, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concept Institute, where we are very thankful for support. And uh, But realistically, now we need to uh, hit the ground running. We need to develop the mission. So we are building a, technology, a set of technology demonstration missions that will allow us to demonstrate solar sailing as a capable propulsion. Once we have that, we have the spacecraft that is already uh, being, you know, designed well to, to survive the mission, uh, the duration, and uh, to be able to operate. So realistically, another technology that we need to develop, it's not only propulsion, but also power. And so we have a very good concept for distributed power. It's a small nuclear uh, um, sort of the elements around, around the spacecraft, not a single piece, but a small set of uh, those elements. And so essentially... Uh, this concept, the propulsion and the power, once we address this too, I think the mission can go. You would and need some some version of like an RTG because yes. you're so far away from the sun. So absolutely, it has to absolutely. be decaying. Mm -hmm. But but you're saying, but you would like break it up. So instead of having like one RTG generator, like say the Voyagers, you would have several of them? There are two different ways of launching the mission. One way is to have a very... Uh, when we deal with the solar, solar sailing spacecraft, the metric is the, the, the performance metric is the area to mass ratio, area of the sail to the mass of the spacecraft. So the larger that area to mass ratio, the larger uh, the acceleration you can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the larger velocity you can reach. And so the larger the solar radiation pressure impact on that sail. So, but now you either build very large sail 
So we're talking about very significant sales structure, which is now getting into dynamic control, uh, deployment mechanism, stability of that, or build smaller spacecraft. So potentially, we realize that our mission-capable spacecraft will have a weight of roughly uh, about 80 kilograms. And so with 80 kilograms, we can deliver full mission. It's mm. included, the, this 80 kilogram, the, it, it includes the a telescope, ammeter meter telescope, propulsion block, communication, we'll use optical communication for communication purposes. And so that is possible to be launched in one piece. But to do that with the technologies uh, present today, we need to develop uh, sail materials to be able to come uh, closer to the sun. So another way to do that, it's not uh, flying a single spacecraft with a single uh, large sail, but instead flying maybe two or three smaller spacecraft and do once you pass by the sun, once you accelerate those smaller spacecraft to larger velocity, then just aggregate in flight. Mm -hmm. And so you already kick your spacecraft to needed velocity. And now they came close to each other, still maneuvering the solar sailing. They can uh, sort of compensate for relative velocity. They can uh, come and dock. And docking the spacecraft, you're actually forming that larger spacecraft. And that will be moving with very high velocity. So essentially, these are the two technologies, two, two different paths that we take. So, so let's imagine, let's fast forward. Um, you finish the phase three. NASA decides to turn this into an actual proper mission. Uh, some of the other pathfinding technologies have been worked out. We're fi five years down the road, maybe 10 years at the most. Um, and and the, the mission is on the pad. What how will it work? Like how will sort of the whole mission unfold from this point? Um, are you asking about the flight trajectory? Yeah, I'm the... sort of imagining like, you know, you've, you've got, you've got a starship, uh, you've got, you know, you've got as you can, because you have to launch towards the sun, obviously that takes a tremendous amount of Delta V, but it could probably handle it. So you've got a few thousand kilograms of payload for your spacecraft if you want. How, how would you sort of see the whole, the whole mission unfolding from that point forward? Right. So for proper operation in the solar gravitational uh, focal region, we need to have at least three smaller spacecraft, three spacecraft at 80 kilogram weight. So, so why do we need three? So one spacecraft will be uh, measuring solar corona specifically and subtracting it from the data because we need to remove solar corona. We mm. need to have independent measurement of solar corona to remove it. And so it can be done one of the three spacecraft anyway. So basically, uh, so that is uh, the number of three is because another spacecraft will be established in local reference frame. Remember, we discussed that local reference frame. And so those three spacecraft are interchangeable. They can move in, in and out to do the same job. And basically, they all will be able to independently communicate to the ground using one meter telescope and maybe uh, 10 meter telescopes on the optical telescopes on the ground. And so what, what else is needed there? So essentially, uh, once we have those uh, spacecraft uh, uh, sitting on the launch pad, and so essentially we're, they, they will be launched to high Earth orbit, uh, at high Earth orbit, they will open their sails and start uh, moving towards the sun uh, by uh, sort of uh, re re reducing kinetic energy. Yeah. So the, the velocity will be reduced. They will be flying by the sun in about three or four to five months. And then they will re-orient their sails and uh, will start picking up very large velocity, uh, solar radiation pressure. And so acceleration from the solar radiation pressure will kick them very strong so that by the time when they're going by uh, at the five astronomical units away, we know exactly where they're going because we can trim all the navigational errors. And so we can inject them on pretty much ballistic trajectory all the way to the focal region of the solar gravitational lens. If we need to compensate for residual orbital uh, un un uncertainties, we still have electric propulsion in flight. And then we just coast along that focal region to almost 25 years. There are plenty of interest in science to be done. So uh, now, we, now we are focusing on uh, solar gravitational lens enabled science, right? So I imaging of exoplanet. But there is a lot of interest in secondary science the way we, we see it. Uh, studying the solar system, maybe flying by several uh, distant uh, objects in the solar system in the Kuiper Belt, uh, studying the uh, so solar system mag magnetosphere, local uh, local uh, um, uh, medium. And so there are lots of interesting signs as we fly there. Once we get there, once we start reaching 
re re region of 550 astronomical units, this uh, three spacecraft will be able to observe the host star already immediately, because now the light is amplified and all three will be able to see host star with no problem. There is single noise ratio in one second more than, uh, uh, I think it's more than uh, 10,000. So essentially the light is there, it's very bright. And so now they will be able to track the light from the host star, establish a local reference frame. And as they, as they move from 550 to roughly 550, 650 AU. So the local reference frame will be well, well established. And by that time, the um, Einstein ring will be well separated from the solar disk. And at that time, by 650, we'll, we'll be able to start observing exoplanet because exoplanet will be separated from the solar disk and uh, the solar, solar plasma will not be a significant source of noise. And we will be able, from 650, the science operations will begin. From 650 to 900, we will be still moving at roughly 22, 25 AU per year. And so for the next 10 years, we'll be doing science operations. We'll be moving uh, this three spacecraft. We'll, we need the three spacecraft to compensate also for the diurnal rotation because the planet rotates. And so to be able to remove the diurnal rotation, uh, we need to absorb it in a higher temporal cadence. Essentially that will uh, be done, will be uh, all the three spacecraft will be observing exoplanet. And so they will be coming in in the image, we're moving out from the image, but they will be doing sort of sl slicing it in the different pieces. And uh, ultimately the image will be formed, um, depending on the target, the image may be formed within uh, three to six months. And, um, but uh, we're talking about diurnal rotation. The diurnal rotation comes from the uh, uh, fact that or the planet rotates. And in this case, uh, we, will never be, uh, we will never see the planet full disk. It will be just phases of the planet. And so when we deal with phases of the planet, the images are formed within a few weeks only. Hmm. And so within a few weeks, essentially, you will be able to uh, build temporal uh, uh, set of data to be able to then remove uh, cloud cover, remove the diurnal effect of diurnal rotation, smearing on the, because of the, uh, the, or the diurnal rotation on the image. And so we will be moving in that uh, focal region for the next 10 years, collecting data. And as we, as we discussed at the beginning of this conversation, the longer we observe, the better the quality will become. Because you have a lot of data, we need to translate, uh, transmit the data to the ground. We're talking about kilobits per second. We don't yeah. need higher, I mean, kilobits is, uh, is as much as we want, maybe even less, less than kilobit, because ultimately our data is basically brightness uh, of uh, Einstein ring on the image sensor, that's all. And so we're moving the data, moving, moving, moving the data down to the ground, and then we'll be using the convolutional algorithms to recover the image. What do you think is the biggest technical risk right now? What is the what is the big thing that you would like to figure out to give you a lot of confidence that that this will work, that 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 it, that it will fly? Uh, multiple missions are going uh, to larger heliocentric distances identified sort of very well known challenges, and those challenges will be power, communication, and longevity. So in this case, I guess I will uh, also embrace this, the power. We need to have very confident uh, uh, source of power. We know how it, how, it, uh, how it can be built. Now the technology readiness of that approach is about year L3. We need to build more confidence in, in building this type of distributed power on the spacecraft. That's one point. Oh, I, so, sorry. So just because the with the RTG, it, it starts to degrade the moment you launch it and yep. you're losing, say, 25 years of power before you actually get into science operations. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, the challenge there, of course, is we need to have less power hungry instruments so that will not derive, uh, drive the power available quite significantly. But still, beginning of life uh, will be a lot of power. Then we need to dissipate that power in flight because we or maybe accumulated in the batteries on, on board. And then uh, beginning of science operations, that will be the uh, the key metric. How much power do we have at the beginning of science operations after 25 years of flight? And then we still we continue we we, we we continuously moving in the image plane, uh, following the optical axis, uh, the, the image of that star of that of that exoplanet. So we thrust and electrical thrusters will be most uh, the, the 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 most power consumption will be due due to electrical thrusters because we move a lot. Mm -hmm. And so by moving, we're reducing power. And then the another key metric is how much power will we have by 900 AU. So we are designing 
uh, the power system such that will allow us to have reasonably comf comfortable margin by the time we reach 900 EU. So that something is important and we would like NASA to pursue this technology that we developed with uh, uh, distributed power sources, which is integrated with the radiation hardened battery. And so that's one thing. The second is of course, I mean, um, the, the, the challenge that we identified and that is, um, <laughs> think about this, we never built a mission that will have to survive 40 years of flight. I mean, we have missions that have survived 40 years accidentally, of flight. Accidentally. Accidentally, so yeah, Voyager, accidentally. the Voyagers, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Pioneer's a wonderful example. Voyager's a wonderful example. But they were built to last maybe 3.5 years in flight. <laughs> and they were designed very simple, right? And they were able to operate extensively very well. But they were as simple as brick, in a sense. Sorry, sorry to say that. that as simple as possible. There are nothing can be broken. So the mission design for this type of mission need to uh, change the design paradigm essentially, because we have to now engineer for longevity. And so, as you know, electronic components, they're not really <laughs> long leaf. So because the more electronic components we have, the less, uh, the, the more likely they will uh, you know, go, go, go berserk on you. So yeah. realistically longevity and then uh, contamination and flight. So these are the topics are uniquely uh, you uniquely um, uh, came into the study of the solar gravitational lens. We need to address not only classical challenges, which is communication and power, but also longevity and, um, you know, uh, mission organization. So essentially, in the history of humanity, only a few projects uh, that lasted more than a few years, few few decades were unknown. For example, Great Wall of China, built over centuries of, you know, uh, people were building that or, or, or Egyptian pyramids, right? So it's basically different organization, the different the different societal organization, and different objectives. But here, it's a mission that needs to be developed, launched, uh, flown, and operated uh, by the group of people uh, who will be dedicated to uh, to to work. That is something we had never done, never never done before. But that is interesting. Well, so, and, and uh, that has, I mean, that has value across everything that NASA does. I mean, imagine if the Voyagers were built with an intentional lifetime of 50 years right from day one and not three years. Absolutely. And so everything that we discuss with solar gravitational lenses pushes pretty much every element of mission design because we need to have uh, reliable components, reliable operations, autonomy, because we cannot drive the spacecraft by sending back and forth commands from, from the ground to spacecraft. It must be, we must be able to cut umbilical cord because any mission that we operate today at NASA, we have that umbilical cord from DSN, you communicate uh, so, so that uh, when the rover on Mars, uh, pretty much daily, we communicate with the rover daily, telling, he, telling the rover what to do. With a mission like that, we have to cut the umbilical, we have to trust the system, it will, be, it will have to operate autonomously and have to compensate for any anomaly that is occurring, happening on board, and they will be anomalous, but it should be able to sustain the anomaly and operate. So this is something conceptually is very different. We need to trust our robots more than we used to. And so that changes significantly the way we operate uh, our assets in space. And, and so there's a the, similar challenge that's being faced by the team that's working on the interstellar probe, same kind of distance regime, not quite as far, but but that same need to have a very long cruise phase before you before you and you need to have your spacecraft still still operating. And I think really the unexplored parts of the solar system, they are the dis the more distant places, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, the Kuiper belt, that all of these needs to be this shift towards longer lived spacecraft that can still be in middle age and doing its its work. And if we ever do want to send a spacecraft to another star system, then we're looking, even if we're going to go at a significant portion of the speed of light, we're still looking at decades, if not hundreds of years of continuous operation. And that takes a completely different paradigm of thinking. Exactly. And the thing about solar gravitational lens is the first stone for us to cross that creek between the planet Earth to nearby stellar systems. So that's a we are wandering outside the solar system to a very specifically identified region. This region is very well studied by now. So the solar gravitational focal region. 
And so by doing that, we essentially will have to develop technologies that will enable us to move further. And that is the uh, most powerful realization that as we build solar gravitational lens, and it will push every mission design, every technology beyond the current limits. And so we uh, do not see a showstopper. We, we see challenge in development, but exciting technology yeah. development that is based on the technology we have today. And so I didn't mention also solar, solar sailing because with solar sailing, with the technologies that we, technology demonstration missions that we are developing now, we should be able in about three years with our industry partners to start, to start flying those uh, TDMs uh, that will be flying with the f- uh, faster and ever faster velocities. And once we do that, imagine what we can do with this uh, fast transits through the solar system, because uh, that can be, those technologies can be, those spacecraft can be used as drones to study solar system with velocities, reaching velocities of seven to 10 astronomical units per year at a cost of roughly 15 to 20 million per spacecraft, Mm -hmm. 20 million. It changes the paradigm of solar system exploration. Now we're talking about long lived spacecraft. We can study distant uh, satellites of uh, planets or objects in the solar system with the uh, uh, cadence much faster than once per 20 years. We can do this every year, several of them, especially yeah. at the cost we're talking about. You could imagine so, a starship loaded with a hundred of these, and then it just know. it just throws them towards the sun. Each one goes off to a different Kuiper Belt object and gives us a proper survey of the Kuiper Belt or the the Trojan regions or, or anything out there that's of interest to us. Exactly. And here within the inner solar system, maybe, maybe actually within the solar system, we don't have to rely on optical uh, communication capability. We can shape the surface of the sail in the, in the parabola and use microwave radiation basically to communicate with the earth using deep space network. So because we have a very large sail on the spacecraft to start with just, uh, repurposing the sail after, after we went through a solar perihelion, we can use that sail, we may be dropping part of it and leaving, let's say, 10, 10 meter diameter on, that, on, the, on the sail craft. We can use 10 meter antenna in, in space, communicating with microwaves uh, back to the ground. And so now you have very capable spacecraft that actually very light, uh, inexpensive, going to very different places. And we can, uh, you know, use, uh, go going by, you know, Enceladus, in, in uh, uh, Europa, and uh, just taking the first data in situ measurements, not crushing them in the in, in this uh, bodies, of course, but actually having some in situ uh, biosignature detection. Yeah. And we can do that much faster rather than waiting for those missions, for flagship missions every 30 years. Wow. That's That's the change. Well, it's absolutely fascinating, and I really hope this happens in in both of our lifetimes. Um, if people want to keep track of what you're working on, what's the best place to do that? Well, at, at this moment, maybe contacting us uh, uh, directly. And so we'll be talking, uh, there will be a, a conference breakthrough discuss this year in June. So we'll be talking about this, um, uh, the set of missions that we I discussed uh, a, few, a few minutes ago, the fast transit through the solar systems, through the solar system. We'll be talking about those, will be a separate, a separate session devoted to discussing what can be done in the studies of the solar system using this fast uh, moving transit and missions for the solar system. And that those missions will enable us to move uh, toward the solar gravitational lens. And so that will be another way to contact us, the team, and to discuss if, if, uh, if, if right. anybody interested. And if anybody has an idea for a power plant that can last 50 years, let you know. Absolutely. <laughs> well, so it's been an absolute pleasure. It's super exciting. As I said, I really, really hope I cannot wait to see a megapixel resolution image of another Earth that is mind bending. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Good luck with your work. I really hope it gets chosen. And uh, if you do, uh, when you get those first pictures, send them send them our way. Absolutely. We'll do that. Thank you very much. All for right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.